Lipschitz functions are, of course, the most natural class of functions that we can define on any metric space because their definition requires no other structure than the metric. Let's recall that a real valued function on a metric space X is called Lipschitz if there exists some L real number such that for every pair of points from your space that you pick, the measure of how far the images are is bounded by L times the distance of X from Y. So if you have some control over how far the two points are, then you get a control on how far their images will be. This can make sense if here you have Y as a different metric space other than R. Of course, we're Sobolev theory, we're looking at real valued functions and this still makes sense. Uh, I mean, the real valued target is of more interest to us. So this structure, remember, this definition only needs the notion of the distance and there is no measure involved at this point. There are many reasons why Lipschitz functions are nice. Well, one thing is for simplicity, but also, so Lipschitz functions on, say, Euclidean spaces are very close to, to being smooth, so to being C1. They are uh, differentiable almost everywhere, which is the famous uh, Rademacher theorem. And with that differential, with that derivative, uh, we can um, do basically what we can do with C1 functions, with Lipschitz functions. Uh, this leads to things like um, uh, area and co-area formulas. So area formula, and about them we have had separate chapters uh, previously. So co-area formula and so on. Also, uh, Lipschitz functions, modulo, integrability results. So, for example, you can take a constant function on Rn. It's very nice. It's uh, Lipschitz. It has a zero derivative everywhere, but it's not technically in Sobolev because it's not integrable. But come on, that's very... Um, that's the least of reasons not to be in a Sobolev class. So, at least locally, um, they are... Sobolev classes in Sobolev uh, classes W1P of Rn and this is for all P which is even including the infinity so um, this means that the derivatives are bounded well derivatives are bounded by the Lipschitz function the norm of the gradient which explains this so all in all the message from this and i recommend you check those uh, chapters about uh, rademacher's theorem area for my query formula and whatnot to convince yourself that lipschitz functions are quite nice so once we give up the notion of c1 which is a very euclidean notion uh, the c1 the lipschitz functions are quite the best replacement for them. But let's move into the realm of general metric measure spaces and let's see how nice, how um, from an analytical point of view, from Sobolev theory point of view, how good are Lipschitz functions. So to begin with, uh, we have this uh, easy fact to prove that um, if u from a metric space into R 
is L Lipschitz, that means Lipschitz with the constant L specified, then rho, which is the constant function L defined on X, is an upper gradient of U. Uh, recall that the notion of upper gradient does not require any measure. So at this point, we don't even have a measure specified on the metric space X. Um, and the notion of upper gradient, not weak upper gradient, if you happen to know about it, is completely metric object. And of course, this is a Borel function, so that technicality is also taken care of. So let's prove this and then see what this means about Lipschitz functions belonging to Sobolev class. Well, we have to fix an arbitrary rectifiable curve. So fix a rectifiable curve, gamma uh, from AB into X. And without loss of generality, we shall assume it is arc length parameterized. So it is arc length parameterized. Then, okay, so we have that integral of this row over gamma ds. Uh, will be integral of the constant function L over gamma ds. So this would be just 1. And this is, uh, well, equal to L length of the curve gamma. But length of the curve gamma, which remember is defined through this uh, supremum of all distances of partitions along the curve, uh, if in particular, if you take a partition that is the obvious one with the first and end point, this implies that this is bigger than L times. Length of any curve is bigger than the distance of the end points of that curve. We've also seen that before in the chapter on uh, curves in metric spaces. So this is one fact that we know. And on the other hand, from being Lipschitz, we see that u of gamma of b minus u of gamma of a, absolute value, if I, this stupid um, software lets me put absolute value here. Okay, so it interprets it as something, come on. Okay, and then this will be less than, so being Lipschitz means that it's less than L times the distance of the inputs, which is gamma B, gamma A. So from this inequality two and let's call this inequality one, you get the upper gradient inequality that you want. So from these two put together, you see that U of gamma B minus U of gamma A, the value of U at the two endpoints is less than or equal to integral over gamma of this row ds. And since gamma was arbitrary, uh, we have proven that that row is an upper gradient to you. Okay, so constant function L is an upper gradient of this Lipschitz function u. Um, recall that to be in to be in n1p of x d and mu. So now bring in the measure, a Borel measure on uh, the space x. So to be in the n1p of the space, we need to have a u measurable before it was just a function, a Lipschitz function. Um, but actually, Lipschitz is continuous, so Borel measure, so this becomes, so this is redundant, so it is measurable, 
So, but we need to have u belonging to LP of x with respect to this mu. And that rho belongs to LP of x mu. And uh, under some very sim simple assumptions, we this, this can happen. If uh, measure of the whole space x is finite, then clearly we see that rho belongs to LP of x mu because, well, let's compute. So integral of rho to the power p d mu over the whole space x will be less than L to the power p mu of the whole space, and we assume that's fine. So that's uh, clear. Now for the function u itself, so u itself will be Uh, bounded function if diameter of the space x is finite. Well, uh, this follows from being Lipschitz. You just fix any one point and all other values of uh, the function u, you fix this x naught, so u y absolute value uh, by a simple application of triangle inequality so u y will be less than u of x naught plus ellipsis distance of y from x naught. And now we're saying that this is uh, bounded by the diameter. So this will be less than a universal constant independent of the uh, input y. So, and, and if this is the case, then integral of u to the power p d mu over x will be less than m to the power p measure of x finite. So if you were talking about a bounded metric space with a finite total measure, then you will see that, so let's record this. So if diameter of x is finite and the measure of the whole total space is finite, then Lipschitz functions on x belong to n 1 p of x for any p bigger than 1, including also infinity, right? Because in the above, you're taking essential supremum and that also checks. So, um, well, these conditions that the diameter be finite and the measure be finite often um, well if if they not are true then locally at least they are often true well locally um, diameter is of course finite you take a point and you take just the neighborhood a ball of radius something and the fact that the measure of the finite balls be finite is um, a very common assumption it's not necessarily true but um, we often assume that the measure is doubling, which in itself has this assumption that measure of the balls of finite radius are non-zero and uh, finite. This non-zero part makes sure that mu is not the trivial measure. So at least locally this does happen. So locally Lipschitz functions belong to subtle functions if the measure is doubling. But the whole business of how Lipschitz functions um, behave within Sobolev class is actually very important. So uh, a repeating theme, a question that comes up a lot, a question of interest in Sobolev classes, in any Sobolev theory, be it the Newtonian Sobolev or Hiwash Sobolev, or any other notion of Sobel of class is whether and when uh, the Lipschitz class uh, is dense in um, the the in the Sobel of class. So we saw that it's quite very easy and natural that Lipschitz functions 
are Sobolev functions, but how big of a subset are they? And um, uh, a desirable condition is when it is, uh, it is dense. If that is the case, many arguments uh, about Sobolev functions can be reduced to checking them for Lipschitz functions only. For example, if you want to prove a Poincare inequality on a space, instead of looking at all Sobolev functions, which are measurable functions uh, represented up to some uh, small set and stuff, you can just ignore that whole thing and look at Lipschitz functions, which hopefully are more easier to deal with. So, um, yeah, my goal with this one was uh, to remind you that we have already a natural class of functions that are quite important, the class of Lipschitz functions, and also this tiny theorem that not difficult to prove that Lipschitz functions do belong to Sobolev classes under quite mild assumptions, at least uh, locally they do. Uh, with that, uh, I'll end this lecture and see you in the next one. Thank you.